prayer. Pray with me. Our God and our Father in heaven, we approach your throne of grace and mercy in the name that's above every name, and that's the name of Jesus. Thanking you again, Father, for life, thanking you for health and strength, food, clothing, shelter over our head, right frame of mind. Uh, dear God, we know that all good and perfect gifts come from you. And dear God, we know at the end of the day, you are the source of all life. And everything that we have is just, and where we obtain it, is just a resource. And so, Father, we give you the, the praise and the honor and the glory uh, for every good and perfect gift. And dear God, most of all, the gift of your son, uh, Jesus, uh, opening your heart to us in love by sending him, uh, showing, Father, that you care for we, your people, created in your image. And Father, there should be no trial or tribulation that we go through in our life that will ever cause us to think that we are separated from your love. I pray that, Father, we always remember in the dark days what we remember in the good days is, God, that you're always there and that your love and your, your patience and your presence is always there with your children, even when we don't understand. Dear God, I pray that you be our brother Scott. Just thank you, Father, for his faithfulness. Thank you for his example. Uh, Father, what a husband should be taking care of his wife. And I pray that you will strengthen our sister Scott. And Father, we just right now thank you for answered prayer according to our will and her situation. We pray that, Father, as we continue to lift her up to your throne, that, that Father, she can continue to grow in her body, mind, and in spirit. Father, again, our brother Lloyd, who, a great example of what brotherly love uh, should be like, both in the physical and the spiritual, who's concerned about his brother Wesley and their God, not only his physical well-being, but his spiritual well-being. And thank you for Brother Lloyd, also who understands there's power in our God. And uh, we lift our brother Wesley up, uh, his body, his soul, his spirit to you, dear God, knowing that you do all things well. And I just pray that you'll continue to be with Brother Lloyd and always bring to our brother Lloyd's ready recollection the things that he needs to do as he washes his brother's feet uh, to help our brother Wesley to understand there's nothing more important uh, in his life than his soul salvation. And I just thank you for Brother Lloyd and his love and his concern uh, for his brother while he can do something about it and not wait like the rich man uh, that we read about in Luke 16 who waited till it was too late for him to be able to do anything to be concerned about his family. And dear God, be with our brother Donald, the Valier family and their sick. You know, the things that they're dealing with right now, our sister Valier and brother Donald, uh, we, we thank you for what they mean to the family of God and their faithfulness, uh, dear God, to, to your kingdom. Dear God, you know the, the sickness that's going on in that home. And Father, we just pray that you'll give them a, a source of relief uh, and as they go through this, this sickness in their body. I pray that they will use it as a greater opportunity, Father, a greater opportunity to pray even the more, knowing that they're able to do above all what we ask or think. And we ask, Father, that uh, you be with our little sage. Uh, for, dear God, let's pray that the sickness can stay away from her little body. Thank you, God, as she develops. And Father, for our sister Gibbons and brother Gibbons and that family, thank you so much for them as well, dear God. Uh, thank you for their great example, brother Gibbons. Uh, from the moment he obeyed the gospel and understood it, his patience, his desire, and his hunger to want to do right and to lead his family right, Father. What a what a great example he and sister Gibbons have been. Uh, over a short period of time, they've been in the family of God to open up their home, dear God, that you might. You might get the worship that you desire, that you seek after, John 24, from your people. They they were concerned about what you were concerned about in that area. And dear God, I just pray, dear Father, that you just continue to bless them. I pray you'll strengthen our dear sister as she goes through this pregnancy. We know she had tough times, as was mentioned to our brother Gibbons, with pregnancy, dear God. We pray that you'll give us some relief, uh, give us some comfort. And dear God, we pray, dear God, that the life in her womb, Father, will be one that will come out. Uh, successful and be healthy and dear God we will always be mindful to give you the praise honor and glory Father whatever the outcome one thing I know that this family will understand and know is that you are God and that you do all things well and that you make no mistakes you're omniscient the Father we just pray that you will strengthen them and Father we just pray that you will be with this family as they strive and they serve and they make efforts to be the people of God the family of God you would have them to be now be with us all, Father, as we study together from your word. We pray whatever questions are asked, we pray that the answers that are given will not be from man, but, Father, they'll be from your word rightly divided, because we dare not try to steal any of your glory, because life down here is never about us. It's always about you. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, brothers and sisters, thank you all uh, so much. And what I'll do, I don't have any questions that were asked of me, and so we'll open it up. Uh, if anybody have any Bible questions, this is the time to ask your Bible question. Uh, just raise your hand, and uh, I'll go ahead and call them. If anybody have any Bible question? Okay, go ahead, my brother Gibbons. Yes, um, I, I talked to Brother Green about this. I believe I talked to Brother Sanders about this as well. Um, so me and my family, we uh, we went to uh, Fort Sam Houston Church of Christ. And, uh, Brother Starks taught a lesson on, I understand the context of his lesson. I do understand. I didn't get to ask him what he meant by it. He talked about wine, drug abuse, and alcohol abuse. And so that was like the gist of his lesson. And so... Um, he brought up a point that Christians should only do certain things uh, when it pertains to wine and drugs for medicinal purposes. Like I said, again, I, 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 I've studied this with you, Brother uh, brother Stevenson, and, and y'all dealt with this on the broadcast and many other videos that I've went back to study. And I know when we were talking about in Numbers chapter 6, uh, when one makes a vow of a Nazarite, in a, in a, even in the Old Testament, uh, when they're finished with and completed with their vow, they are able to partake in wine. Uh, we know that the sin uh, is is not drinking wine, and I just want to bring it to the forefront to make sure I'm not missing anything. But I think he said, I haven't got to ask him, Lord, well, I'm going to ask him tomorrow. I think he said from, like, if you are drinking an alcohol beverage, it was sin. And like I said, I, I haven't got to ask him yet, but I know, you know, in uh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, when it talks about, um, let me go there. I just want to go to, I don't want to just be sure. talking yeah, about it. First Timothy first chapter 3. Okay. And we'll go there. First Timothy chapter 3. And, uh, and in the context of this is qualifications. Yes, sir. Of leadership in the church. Where it, yes, it says, when it says not given to wine, nor striking, nor grief, because he looked for a patient, not a brawler, not covetousness. And like, and so... Like when I talk to him, you know, I want to make sure I, I do got, you know, I line up a line, precept on precept, uh, as far as, like, if a Christian does want to partake in a beverage, that is not fair, you know, because I know some of our brethren, they try, I don't know where they get uh, some of these things that they get it from saying, well, this is a sin, that is a sin. And so, like I said, I just wanted to um, touch on that and just bring it to the forefront. I know Ephesians uh, chapter 8. I mean, forgive me, chapter 5, verse number 18 says, don't be drunk in the wine, we're in access. And so, like I said, I just wanted some help from the brother. Okay. I'm talking to the brain, and I'm talking to the brother Sanders about this, and we all see it in one spirit as well, but I just wanted to bring it because it was an open forum today. But like I said, I have studied this with you guys, and I do right. know the answer, but I want to make sure, you know, my soul word is yeah. uh, that I can rightly divide the word the right way. Yeah. Okay, uh, brothers and sisters, and... Uh, Let's begin with this. First of all, when you look up the word wine, there's only one Greek word for wine. Uh, let's look at it, if we could, in John 2. Let's go to John 2. Now, you have to understand this, brother. We all have to understand it. If it's wrong and sinful to drink wine, then Jesus sinned, and he, he, he encouraged people to sin. Now, there's only one Greek word, John chapter 2. This is what Jesus does at the, his first miracle that's recorded in the, as a deal with wine. John 2 and 3, and when they wanted wine, now we're going to look at that word, John 2, 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. G3631. G3631. Three, one. Here's what it word. Oinos. That's the only Greek word you're going to see. Oinos. Uh, wine. You can say literally or figuratively wine. Wine frets. Okay? And so we see here that Jesus turns water into wine. See, what our brethren do because they're legalists, they try to make this wine be, well, it, it wasn't anything that anybody could get drunk on. But that's not true. Uh, this is simply fermented uh, uh, grapes uh, that if you drink too much of it, you can, in fact, get drunk off of it. So 
But remember, it's not what goes into an individual that makes them unclean. It's what comes out of the individual that makes them, un makes them unclean. And so uncleanness begins in the heart. So now, here you go, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Gibbons. The burden of proof is going to be on them to show us in the Bible where we see the word wine differently than the word oinos. Because, and here's what, you, what I want you to remember when you talk to them. Because so if sipping wine or drinking wine is a sin, then why did Paul tell Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.23, I want, you, I want us to go there. Same Greek word. This is why I'm bringing this up. I don't care if you are sick. There's never a time you can sin. Just because you're sick doesn't give you a lot of reasons to sin. So if wine, drinking wine is a sin, then what Paul is telling Timothy is it's okay to sin if you're sick. Now, in 1 Timothy 5.23, he tells Timothy, drink no longer water. Now, again, he's giving him some instruction advice here. But use a little wine. So he tell him, go ahead and just sin a little bit. Same Greek word, G3631, oino, same word, for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities. Okay, y'all see that word there? Now, 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 now here, here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to see. Now, I want you to get this as we talk about this. Well, I'm going to open this up in a minute, but I want to show us something here. I want to show us something. Give me one second, and then I want to bring this up, and I, and I see your hand. Uh, Brother Green, but give me one second if you don't mind, real quick. Let me. See. I wanna, I wanna go if we could to Matthew twenty-seven forty-eight. Now here, here's what I'm gonna ask. You know, you start if you start telling people that Jesus drank wine. Okay, now here we go. Did Jesus drink wine? Now, I want you to look at something with me. Did Jesus drink wine? Now, I want you to go to Matthew 27, 48 with me. Now, this is going to show Jesus when he was on the cross, okay? When he was on the cross of Calvary. And I won't, and so it just won't be me talking. I'm going to get, when I read this, this word, I'm going to get somebody to pull this up in their Greek concordance on their phone, okay? Now, look at Matthew 27, 48. And straightway... One of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. Okay, now, this is what happened when Jesus was on the cross. Somebody ran to him and they put, the scripture says here, vinegar on a reed and gave him the drink. Somebody pull up this word vinegar for me and just see if I'm getting something wrong about this word vinegar. Now this is a different word than oinos, but I just want to show you and look what it look what it says in, in uh, Matthew 27 48. What is that word when you when you pull that up? Anybody have it? Anybody can oh go ahead brother yeah. Green you got your hand up. Go ahead my brother. Uh, no, I wasn't dealing with that, but Brother Jerry got his hand up. I'll go after Brother Jerry. Okay. All right. I got the definition. Okay. What's that definition? You want me to read definition of the lexicon? Yeah, either one. It doesn't matter. I'm just, just curious. All right. It's say number one, vinegar. Wow. The mixture of sour wine or vinegar and water, which the Roman soldiers were accustomed to drink. Okay. And so... But but then that's a different Greek word. You see you see that? And so to, to your point, brother, uh, but it, it's it's sour wine. That's what vinegar that's what vinegar was. But but here's here's the point I want to make. When you were talking, brother uh, uh, Gibbons, about them going to uh, what the elders and the deacons for qualifications, it's not not saying that they couldn't drink wine. That that was not. He's just telling they should not be given too much wine. They cannot and you cannot be drinking. To the point to where you get drunk and it overtakes you because God will hold you accountable. Is it wise to stay away from it because it can alter your mind and get you into a drunken stupor? Yeah. yeah. But to, to say that it's a sin because someone drinks wine, there's no scripture that supports that. 
See, what, I, what the legalists do, and I'm going to show it, I'm going to pass it, but what the legalists do, brothers and sisters, the Pharisees, they always make laws for this purpose, to try to protect you. They don't think that, that you and I can love Jesus enough on, on our own. So they put laws and rules and regulations in place to prevent you from doing certain things because they don't, don't believe you can control yourself. So I have to tell you that it's wrong to drink wine because if I don't, there's a possibility you get drunk and you go overdo it. But just because someone may overdo something, I can't make laws like that. But that's what the legalists do. And they do it under the guise of protecting you from you. And we can't we can't never go with that, okay? Brother Jerry. Uh, your mic's new, Brother Jerry. I, I forgot to put my hand down. All right, go ahead, Brother Green. Yeah, uh, I, I want to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number uh, 15. Ecclesiastes 8 and 15. And the scripture reads, Then I commended mercy, which we know that word means joy, because a man have no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of the labor the days of his life, which God hath uh, given him under the sun. Now, I looked up the word drink, and, 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 and the word means a primitive root to imbibe, literally or figuratively. Uh, and then it has the uh, other words to surely banquet, cert uh, certainly uh, drink, drinker, drinking, drunk, drunker, surely. So when I looked up that word imbibe, because I want to get a be be better definition of that, it says drink alcohol in parentheses. Drink and it has alcohol in parentheses. So when we see that, like uh, Brother Stevenson was saying, the Bible isn't teaching us that drinking is a sin. Being a drunkard is a sin. When you drink to the point to where it causes you to be impaired, that's when you're in sin. And I agree with what the brother was saying, that you know we have too many brethren now I'll use myself personally. I know I'm not a person that can drink, and that's due to past history. So for me, it would be a sin, you know. But like I was telling Brother Gibbons earlier, you know, as the scriptures teach us to him that, you know, if it's a sin to him, a person, then to them it becomes a sin. If they think of it to be a sin, then to them it's a sin. But you can't take other people's liberty to try to you know, come with the thought or idea that, you know, just because a person may take a sip of wine or something like that, oh, you're in sin, and they're not in care. So that's all I want to say. I don't know what happened. I think uh, for some reason, there you go, just came back in. But yeah, that's what I wanted to share, brother. Yeah, thank you, brother. I went out for a little bit. Thank you, all, brother. I appreciate it. And let me add this on this subject. I didn't hear everything you said, brother, uh, brother Green. I want us to go to Romans 14. Now, there's something we got to understand about our liberties. See, if we're not careful, Pharisees try to take away your liberties, brothers and sisters, that we have. But at the same time, brother uh, Gibbons, as you deal with these brethren, you want to also make sure that your liberties don't become a stumbling block to them. You see what I'm saying? You got to you got to give these guys, you know, time to grow in that area, you know, to, to understand that. And again, you know, uh, Romans 14, let me, let me just show you the point that I want to make that Paul makes in, in Romans uh, chapter 14. And this is what we have to do, brothers and sisters, with all of our liberties. This is what Paul is dealing with in, in really the book of Romans uh, in totality, because remember, you got Jews and Gentiles who are now in one body. I want us to get this. They're all in one body now, different background. So you have some Jews who who understood and they kept the Sabbath 
day. You know, they come, come from days keeping the Sabbath day, keeping the feast day. And, and so they are still esteem some of those days. Paul says it's okay if they esteem them days. And this is what I mean, because they're esteeming it unto the Lord. What he's saying is if I was a Jew and the Sabbath day came around Saturday, now I'm not worshiping like I did on the uh, like I did under the old law, but there would be nothing wrong with me as a Jew coming from Judaism to remember, man, you know, on the Sabbath day, that was, you know, the time, uh, you know, God gave my people rest. So on Saturdays come around, y'all remember how God delivered us. And I remember, you know, back on the Sabbath day, uh, it was when, you know, we didn't have to go out and we didn't have to, we didn't have to gather on the Sabbath day. And I'm remembering that day unto the Lord, even though I'm not worshiping. So I can esteem that day if I want to, but I'm esteeming it unto the Lord. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans 15 and verse 5. Let's look at that. Romans 14, 5. One man esteem it one day above another, another esteem it every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. See, that's what's wrong with the Jehovah's Witness saying it's wrong to celebrate birthday. Well, what's wrong with that? If on my birthday I'm saying, man, you know, this is the day God brought me to my mother's womb and gave me life. And I'm giving you credit, God, and I'm blessing you and thanking you for that day. What's wrong with that? Who are you to judge that? That's my liberty. And I can do it today. I can I can sit here today and say, man, thank God for August 24th. Man, that was a great day that my God allowed me life to come into the world. Who's going to say I'm wrong for that? For, my, for me remembering. And I'm, matter of fact, I'm going to eat a piece of cake today because I'm thinking about my birthday, Lord, which you brought me in the world. And he that eat it, eat it to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eat it not to the Lord, he eat it not, and giveth God thanks. And so a, a Jew came and they think it's wrong to eat pork, and then they don't want to eat pork, that's fine. But you can't put no law on me if I want to eat a pork chop. If I want to eat pork chop, I'm not a Jew. I've ate pork chops all my life. There is nothing wrong with it and nothing sinful about that. So now, why are you bring it up? Well, because when you go over to drop down to verse 21, he said the same thing about wine. Romans 14, 21. Now again, if it bothers you, I don't want to violate your conscience. I just want to eat my pork chop in front of you. If it bothers you, I won't drink my wine in front of you. Romans 14, 21. Paul says, it is, a, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby your brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Have you faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. So you see that? So now, so when I'm saying, brother, when you get there, you teach it, brother, like you're supposed to. I know you're going to do a great job, brother, because you have God's spirit with you. You teach them what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you, a lot of them ain't going to agree with it, but oh well, it doesn't nullify the fact that God be true and every man a liar. And you teach what God's word it says, but by no means you got to let them know they cannot put you in a religious straight jacket because they have no scripture that points to the fact that drinking wine is a sin because it doesn't harmonize with the scriptures that we just talked about, okay? But if you do it, if you know it bothers them, eating pork bothers them, you don't take that liberty to violate their conscience. In other words, you be concerned about their conscience and, and their weakness in that area to understand that there's nothing wrong with drinking wine or eating a pork chop. Okay? Any other question, comment, or thought? Any other question? Yeah, Brother uh, Leslie. Yeah, thank you, Brother Stevenson, uh, for that. I uh, just have a couple of comments on, on that. Um, you know, the issue of alcohol sometimes when people talk about it is. Uh, you know, I, I haven't, you know, people who talk about moderate social drinking, I like to always be careful so that uh, we don't give people license to do certain things that would, uh, you know, along the line lead to something else. Uh, when people use John chapter 2 to say that Jesus turned water into an alcoholic wine, I, I would be thinking that because when you look at the amount of alcoholic content, he, he made that would amount to about 120 to 180 gallons of wine, which would mean that Jesus actually got a lot of people drunk that day. Um, that's one thing. And uh, from the use of the word wine, yeah, you're correct, that's the Greek word oinos. But uh, from my understanding of that word, uh, sometimes depending on the context, you can actually tell whether it's referring to 
fermented wine or unfermented wine. And you see that several places in the Old Testament, wine was condemned. You know, it was said that, you know, wine is a mocker, wine is this. And we know from those passages that, you know, he's talking about intoxicating wine and all of that. Sometimes when you see in some passages, it talks about wine in its fruit itself, in the grape, when it has not even been fermented, the Bible still calls it wine. Uh, there's a passage for that, they can get that. So, so I'm, I'm saying that sometimes wine, even while it is still fresh, it is called wine. While it is fermented, it is called wine. It is called wine. So that's why sometimes we need to look at uh, whether or not it is referring to fermented or not. But what I just wanted to say, there are some passages in the um, in New Testament that tells Brother, us... Can I stop you real quick? Because I want to I start. And I, I'm not, I hate that. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. But I, this is what I want us to start doing on, 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 on this Zoom is when we, we say, and me too, and y'all hold me accountable. I want to hold each other accountable. I got a question with what you said. So let me ask you this, and, and, and I'm going to go slow. So with this word wine that we're talking about, 36, 31, let me ask you this. If I drink too much of that, the wine you're talking about, if I drink too much of that wine that Jesus, you're claiming that Jesus made in John 2 is different than intoxication, could I get drunk off of that? Was it possible for me to get drunk off of 3631? If it's an intoxicating wine, yes, you can get drunk. So, so I'm going to ask that question again. So the wine that Jesus made, if I drank too much, I could get drunk. Well, that you, you need to understand my point that I'm saying that wine is the word, is the English word you use, but sometimes it could be intoxicating, it could be not, it could not yeah, be. Yeah, but I'm asking, yeah, I'm with you, my brother. The person could get drunk with water, even not necessarily wine. If you drink too much of water, you could, you could say you're drunk with water. You could even eat excessively and, you know, overfeed yourself. So it's not just... Um, um, yeah, but there's no scripture that says don't get drunk with water. See, you'd have to. What's, there's no scripture that says get, you can don't drink too much water. Yes, what I'm, yes what I'm, I'm, you are right. I'm just saying basically that sometimes the word drunk can refer to being full. So sometimes a person may not necessarily be um, um, be high to the extent of messing up. When you, you don't have to get drunk only when you drink wine. That's my point. You can get drunk even with water and some other liquid. That's that's the point I was making. So I'm saying well, that we might not be able to be certain that what Jesus turned that, water yeah, that into is his alcoholic beverage. That was that was the point I was making. Say, say that again. Say it again. Bro. I said we 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 cannot be certain. We cannot say for certain that what Jesus turned water into was alcoholic beverage. That's my point. But why not though? Yes, because the word wine like I said, could refer to both fermented and non-fermented. Um, um, let me get you to turn Hold on, brother. Hey, brother Kurt. Brother Kurt, let me get you to mute your mic, brother Kurt. Brother Kurt, mute your mic. That's okay, mute your mic. Okay, say that again now, brother Liz. Okay, sorry. I was saying basically that we cannot be certain that what Jesus turned water to was alcoholic beverage because the word wine, as used in the Bible, would actually be referring to both alcoholic. I know we are looking at a Greek word, which I'm not doubting. It's oinos, but I'm saying it could mean either alcoholic and non-alcoholic. But you know, looking at the general word, we are just saying it is alcoholic. That's why we are arguing from that perspective. But th th that's not a problem if we want to go that way. But you know, I want us to address two questions. In First Timothy three. The Bible clearly says that an elder should not be given to wine. That's a clear passage. Now, what does that mean? You remember that in the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 10, the priests were specifically commanded not to drink wine. The priests were not commanded not to be drunk with wine. That's a clear fact. It said, do not drink no wine, you and your sons, uh, when you you know go into the tabernacle and all of that. They were prohibited from drinking wine. And we know today that we are priests. As priests of God today, uh, I think we should refrain from drinking wine, just like the Old Testament priests were prohibited. Now, the elders were directly instructed not to be given to wine. But I don't know how we would interpret that. Not given to wine doesn't mean you can drink a little. We cannot interpret that to me. We can read it, First Timothy 3. 
it is not given to wine. Then, if you want to come over to the details that says not given to much wine, then we, we, if, I don't know how we're going to address that, but I have a question on that. So I just want us to address that question. Does not given to wine not mean not given to wine? Does it mean any other thing? How can we interpret that? That's well, my I wanna, question. Well, first, I want to, I mean, I'm but, with you. But, 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 Steve, I'm sorry. I just want to say, that, see, it says not giving to wine. But then when you look at that word given, that word means addicted. So that would be the same thing that it says in Titus when it says not given to much wine. Because that word given, G-I-V-E-N, means addicted, which be the same thing as being given too much wine. Okay, Brother Green, can I ask you a question? In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 17, the Bible says we should not be given you know, too much wickedness. Does that mean we can be given to a little wickedness? And I, I need you to apply your logic in that passage. I know the passage is not talking about wine. I know that for sure. And I, I do not want you to dismiss that passage. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 17, it says, do not be overly uh, wicked. I mean, do not be over much wicked. Of course, he's talking about too much wickedness or someone that's addicted to wickedness, just like this is talking about not be given too much wine. Now, would Brother Green teach that a person can be given to a little wickedness because what was condemned here was much wickedness. Looking at the argument you just made, but again, can you answer that? Yeah, the thing is, of course, Brother Leslie, I would never teach anybody to uh, be given to any type of wickedness. But when you look at this scripture, and we're dealing with this scripture, you know, when it says not be given, to too much wine, you know, he that's the same thing as saying don't be addicted, which means the same thing that Brother Stevenson was saying is that, you know, you shouldn't drink in excess and to be drunk. I agree. And but that's exactly what Okay, sorry, sorry. I thought you were no, no, that's no. exactly I agree no. with what you said. I'm just saying that that's exactly what Ecclesiastes is saying. That you shouldn't be much wicked. That I'm, I'm using your argument because of the word much. It means you don't have to do it in excess. Much we can. Yeah, but, but, yeah, so yeah, I, 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 I want us to. Okay, I want us to be on one. Okay, okay. But but see, brother Leslie, this is what we're doing. See, I call. Let me tell you what I call what you just did. I call that special pleading. I call that special. I call that special pleading because you 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 diverted. And I know you're not doing it on purpose. I I, I pray not. But you diverted from. Wine to prove, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you what you're trying to prove by using the word "be not much." So, 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 and you use one verse to do that. But I'm gonna ask you a question. With see, to do this is not right because I go back up to verse 16 of what you just, what you just used. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7. It says, "Be not righteous over much." What does that mean? Because it, it says, "Be not righteous over much too." In the verse before, it said, "Be not over much with." So we not to be more righteous? Is that what is? Is that is that the argument? See that, that that's to to use that is not, it's not how we how we divide the scripture. To go to that say be not over much wicked. Well, what does be not over, be not righteous over much mean? What does that verse mean? And so we this is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. When we when we are dealing with the subject, we have to stick. We, I'm gonna tell you what we really got to do, read and believe. That's what we have to do. We've got to get rid of the, the the whatever Church of Christ doctrine or whatever we want to call it, or what everybody else teaches, and we all, all me too. We've got to read the scriptures with virgin eyes and virgin ears. We've got to learn to read and believe and not read to try to support what we believe and go to cut another scripture out of its context to support what we're reading. We can't do that. We we cannot do that. Because it's going to cause a disharmony with other scriptures when we do that. And so you've got to go back to what the question was. And that's why I asked the question. We're dealing with wine, okay? Jesus' first miracle was he turned water to wine. That's why I asked the question. Could they drink too much of that wine that Jesus turned water into and get drunk? It doesn't matter about the, uh, the level of an alcohol that was in it. I don't care what the level was. It's called wine for a reason. Because if you drink too much of any wine, different for different bodies, you can become drunk. 
That's that. And so you can't be not over much wicked because First Timothy three eight tells them don't as you as you mentioned, Brother Leslie, and you gave that scripture, give it to much wine. Don't give too much wine, 1 Timothy 3, talking to the deacons. So if it's wrong for the deacons, it would be wrong for the elders. And not just because, but before anybody is a deacon or an elder, you're a Christian. Before you're ever a deacon and elder, you're a Christian. Before you're a preacher, you're a Christian. So what's wrong for a deacon and an elder is wrong for all Christians. Just because these are qualifications for leadership, and it's still when it comes to sin, we're all on the same level. Brother Lloyd. Uh, yeah, it says I'm uh, reading um, the scripture about the wedding uh, piece in that it had been going on for a certain amount of time. And also, um, in my drinking career, I would, I would tell you that when I went out, especially in the military, we went to the bars and and step on boats and everything. The first drinks that you got were definitely, you know, potent. And they were definitely alcohol. Uh, uh, you know, it was, it was designed to be drunk or high or whatever. Now, as the night wore on, it was well known that the alcohol became, you know, watered down or less potent. And the reason that was is because your discernment was no longer um, in play. So it just, if you look at what Jesus did and the master of the feast said, he saved the best for last. And so so that meant that people, the people who drink alcoholic uh, beverages up until that point then they're going to get the uh, the best. What the scripture says that, brother Lord? I'm sorry to cut you off. Can you can you read that for me? I'm, 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 I'll miss. You. Can you read that? Let's read that. What you just okay. said. That's John. What is that? John two. Yes, sir. Can you read what you're saying? I want to. I want to look because I could have missed it. I, I really could have missed this. So I want. I want to make sure. I, so let let's go back to that. Okay. So that's John two. John two. Yes, sir. And verse one will be real to uh no count. No fix things one shall be one. Okay. Okay. The master of the feast called the bride this is what you're uh alluding to and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunken freely, then the poor one. As there's as my example that I would give you, that you know, you go out to the bar and you drink. But you have kept the good wine until now. Okay, so that's what he said. So, uh, again, I was using the same type of example in real life for me. And that when we went out to get to drink, they, at the beginning of the night or at the club, they gave. A good uh, alcohol, but toward the, you know, when it got toward the end, then you weren't necessarily getting that. You were getting watered down because of the discernment of knowing, you know, you were already in a position now that you were drunk. So it seems to me that this is backwards. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, 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 Lord, can I ask you? Uh, I'm sorry, Brother Stevenson. So, like, with the, with the statement you just said, because I was just listening to you when you were saying it, uh, like I said, I, I, I told Willie Green this earlier, and that was the reason why I did want to bring this up, because I do know the answers. I've already studied this with most of the brethren, uh, Brother Ozan, Brother Stevenson, and Brother Fritz, and Brother Green, and so on and so forth. Um, because before I became a member of the Lord's Church, I was in a, a, a denomination of church, and they tried to tell me the same thing. So that was one of the subjects when I became a member that I wanted to ask them about. And so, are, are you saying that Jesus didn't prepare wine because that, because they were already impaired and he didn't want to give them anything stronger? Is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is, if, you're, if you've been drinking for a while, your discernment level 
is not to the point where you're going to look at, you know, it's going backwards. Yeah, you know, it, it, the, your discernment level is lower after you've been drinking rather than when you first start drinking. So, so I'm like, I'm going to say that, they, 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 say what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if usually in, in when people are drinking, that you don't bring the best for last. And, and number one, you can't tell. But this is what I'm saying, brother. But that's but that's not what Jesus did. This is what I'm saying. They were already drunk and impaired, right? We agree with that. Do we agree with that statement? That they were already drunk. Can we just say yes or no on that? Uh, well, uh, you know, I don't believe it was alcohol, but yes, for the sake of argument, yes, go ahead. Okay. And so, if somebody's already drunk, they're already impaired from their other wedding, their other feast, their wedding. And they're already drunk. And Jesus bring out something that's even stronger because in the spiritual context, he explains it that way. That's what I'm saying. So you're saying Jesus brought out something that wasn't stronger than what they had already been. That's what I'm trying to understand. What I'm saying is that from my drinking experience, it happens the opposite no, no, way. Brother, that's what I'm saying. But you, you can't use okay. your experience. What the scriptures are saying is what I, I heard you the military. Well, 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 then, then you basically, know, experience if you, and stuff like that. But I'm asking what the scriptures okay. say, brother. Like, all right. from all based right. on the scriptures, what what did what did Jesus bring out based on the scriptures? All right. Not with your military you, experience you, right. and you going to the bar. What did okay, Jesus I'm trying bring? to answer you now. I'm trying to answer you now. Now, he, if that is alcohol, then he brought better alcohol. Okay. Now we agree. And so. And to, to Eric, but to Brother Stevenson's point, and then the point that we're trying to make, like I said, because this is helpful for me because, like I said, please forgive me. I don't know if Brother Starks actually thought this way, but I'm going to ask him tomorrow. And so this is helping me uh, based on us doing the study together. That's, that's all I'm trying to do, Brother. But I wanted to bring it to the group because I told Brother Green, I said, I felt like it's needful for me to bring it to the group. Can I ask another question? Thank you, brother. Can I ask another question? Let me, and this is the brother Leslie and the brother Lord. I want to ask this question. Okay. If it's not, if it can't get you intoxicated, why? I, 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 and this, y'all, y'all help with me. What's wrong with being given to it? I mean, if, it, if, if what, what, what would be the problem for the scripture to say to stay away from this if it can't get you intoxicated? Why not give into wine if it if it can't do anything? Why not not given to water? Not given to Kool-Aid? Why, why would the scripture say not given to wine if there was no effect? Okay, the wine that the scripture says you shouldn't be given to, it's obvious that it's intoxicating wine. And we are not saying that wine and wine is not intoxicating beverage. What we are saying, which uh, nobody is paying attention to, is that the context tells us if this is referring to intoxicating beverage or not both intoxicating beverages and uh, non-intoxicating beverages are all called wines in the bible so you determine which is which by the context and that's why when the bible says do not drink wine wine is a marker wine is this it's referring to intoxicating drinks because it has a tendency to actually cause problem and um, I, I actually do not like the fact that I have to, you know, you know, debate over this again. But I just want to say that um, if we are applying a particular logic to a passage, and that same logic cannot be replicated in a different passage, then we need to check that particular argument. Now we are applying an argument to First Timothy three, but we are failing to apply it to a similar passage with similar construction. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't um, say anything further again, but I just want us to go over and think about it. If not given too much wine is an authority to drink a little wine, then not given too much wickedness should be an authority to be a little wicked. Uh, thank you very much. Brother Leslie, what about Ephesians 5 and 18, the, the scripture I'm posting in the chat? What about that one? Because okay. we, we talked about Timothy and the qualifications, but what about Ephesians 5 and 18? Okay, you can read it. So let me let me go to Ephesians 5 and 18. It says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled. Okay, good. It's a good passage that's even against you. Now let me let me let me show how it's against you. Now, if you have a bottle, now I want everybody to pay attention to this argument if it would make sense. 
if you have a bottle and you fill the bottle, he said, do not fill this bottle with um, uh, um, kerosene, for instance, or petroleum, but fill it with water. Now, if you fill that bottle with water, there is actually no space for you to fill it with anything else. If there is still a space for you to fill it with anything else, then the bottle was never filled with water. Now, the Bible says, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the, with the Spirit. Now, if you are actually filled with the Spirit, then there will be no space for you to be filled with wine. If you still have some space to be filled with the other kind of Spirit, which is the alcoholic beverage, then you are never filled with the Holy Spirit in the first place. So these are two things that the Bible says you should be filled with one, or you shouldn't be filled with the other one. You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, or you shouldn't be filled with the other kind of spirit, which is the wine. Now, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, just like a bottle that is filled up, there shouldn't be any space for any other content that is uh, that is said that you shouldn't be filled with. So uh, that's a good passage that is, like I said, is even in support of what I'm saying. A Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit would not have the space for you to be filled with any other kind of intoxicating spirit. So that's a good passage. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, one, one, one last thing. We're going to go in order. No, we're gonna, cause I, got, I, I'm a, I'm a, I need to discipline myself. We're going to go in order, and I'm sorry for, for jumping. I saw Brother Donald, uh, and then I saw... Uh, I saw you, Brother Lloyd. I don't know if your hand is just still up, Brother Lloyd, and then I saw Brother Day. But I got something I do want to add to what Brother Leslie said. Go ahead, uh, Brother uh, Donald. I think I saw your hand. No, go ahead, my Brother. I'll continue listening. Okay, go ahead, Brother Lloyd, I think. Okay, Brother Lloyd. Go ahead, Brother David. Yes. Quickly, in the next show, uh, we all have our history with wine, but wine and the new wine is the, the wine is not fermented. The wine is not fermented as a new wine. What producers do when they make wine is they add yeast or whatever intoxicants they do to make it intoxicated. So when Jesus brings a new wine, that wine, uh, I agree with, tend to agree with whether Leslie says that this wine is not the intoxicating type because it is a new wine from the, just being uh, wine makers. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was in regard to what Brother Leslie said. I, I think I lost my thought. Um, oh, I lost my thought. Uh, I'll get it back after after uh, after uh, you, Brother uh, Steve. Uh, go ahead, Brother Donald. Okay. Um, so so there is a a limited discussion around uh, the wine and and talking about fermented unfermented wine uh, lamentation 2 11 and 12 it will speak of one and then when we would go to say isaiah 5 and 11 it speaks of another now back to lamentation 2 and 11 and it reads my eyes fell from weeping i am in torment within my heart is poured out on the ground because people are destroyed. Because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like the wounded in the streets of the city. As their little ones, as their lives have the way in their mother's arms. The wine spoken of in this passage is one which can be drunk by children. So they're saying that in lamentation, there is a different type of wine. But I don't think that's the discussion that we're having tonight, is if we drink wine to or in excess, what effect does it have on individuals? But it also states that in the process, Isaiah 16 and 10, when it talks about, you know, no tread is tread out the wine and oppress, for I have made the shouting to cease. This speaks of the wine as something treaded out in the presses. So in the beginning, every grape, every fruit of the vine, when pressed, comes out as a, a juice, we'll call it. Uh, and then there's a process. So I'm not quite sure where the confusion is right at this moment. 
And so that's all I had to add. Thank you. Now let me let me I want to add something and I saw your hand, Brother Green. Now I want us to go to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. Now we're gonna look at this new new wine. Now and Acts chapter two. Can new wine get you drunk? This is this is going and again I'm gonna tell you, this this word wine is simply oinos. Oinos is the word. Now let's go to then what are the people on the day of Pentecost? What are they thinking about the apostles? Why would they even say what we're about to read? Okay, so we understand. Let's start with verse number 11. They hear Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues. So I'm not the apostles. The wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed, the Bible says, and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mock, said, these men are full of, here we go, new wine. Now, if new wine couldn't get them drunk, why would they stand up here on the day of Pentecost, all these people there, and bring up this word new wine. Now let's look up the word new wine. They're full of new wine. They thought they were drunk. That's exactly what they thought they were, because they thought they drunk new wine. 1098. 1098. Glucose. Glucose, akin to sweet wine, that is must, fresh juice, but used under more saccharine, therefore highly inebriating, fermented wine. New wine. So the idea, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, to, to try to change the meaning, let me tell you why they do that, why people do this. Because again, you cannot believe that Jesus would make something that could get people intoxicated. That's what people are saying. How could Jesus make something and there is a chance that people, if they drank too much of it, they would get intoxicated? He is promoting drunkenness, and he's not doing it. You know, that argument would be just like, why did God invent sex? Knowing that people will have it outside of marriage and fornicate. That's how ridiculous this is. You invented sex. God, you wouldn't invented sex. People wouldn't fornicate. So he's inventing wine and he's promoting drunkenness. And that's not what he's doing. Wine is for fermented. And if you drink too much wine, you can get drunk. But there is no scripture that teaches it's a sin to drink oinos. It talks about drinking too much of it. You get drunk, you get in a drunken stupor, you sin, and then you will give an account to God for it. Brother Green. Yes, uh, two things I would like to address. Uh, back in John chapter 2 with Brother Dave, you know, you use the word new wine and Brother Pizza, but it doesn't say that in that scripture. It says good wine. It didn't say new. When you go back and read it uh, in verse number nine, it says, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence the case, but the servants which uh, uh, drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, verse 10, and said unto them, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine and the men have well drunk. It says, then that which is worse, but uh, thou hast kept the good wine until now. So it didn't call it new. They call it uh, good. And then I want to go back again to Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number 15. And I would like to, uh, uh, for Brother Leslie to give a breakdown and where it talks about eat, drink, and be merry. Because I gave the definition to the word drink. And, and and when you look that word up, uh, when you go back and look up with that word drink, and I'll pull it up again real quick. I'm pulling it up as I speak. Uh, when you go back and you uh, look up the word drink in the, in the context of that scripture. Uh, okay. When you look it up in the context of that scripture, that's back in Ecclesiastes uh, 8 and 15. The word drink is H8354. H354, it says, permanent root uh, to imbibe, literally or figuratively, assuredly, banquet, certainly, drink, drinker, or drinking, drunk, drunker, uh, it says, surely. And the, the words that's used is drink, drinkers, drunker, banquet. Okay, so again, I looked up the word imbibe. 
to see what that word means. And the word imbibe means drink alcohol. So I, I want, if you don't mind, Brother Leslie, if you can go, why would uh, um, Solomon say that uh, to eat, drink, and be merry, and then as they go into the end, he said, for that shall abide with him of his labor, the days of his life, which God giveth un, uh, him under the sun. So could you explain that one for me, uh, Brother Leslie, on why Solomon would say to eat, drink, and be merry, and when we see the word drink means to drink wine, drink alcohol, if, if you really want to get technical with the definition, but then you're saying that you can't do it at all. All right, all right. Um, even if we bring up a hundred passages from the Old Testament that says we should drink alcohol, I think that should not serve as an authority for Christians to drink alcohol. If we want to prove that alcohol is right, I think our direction should be going over to the New Testament to prove that you know alcohol is right. Now, um, having said that, that passage in Ecclesiastes, you know, whether it says drink alcohol or not, is not really the problem. The problem is. There are abundant passages if you want to apply it. The priests were forbidden from de- drinking alcohol at all. You, nobody would argue that. They were not forbidden from getting drunk. They were forbidden from drinking wine. Aaron and his children were forbidden from drinking wine. Christians are priests today. If we want to be Christians as we should, I think that we should also abstain. Uh, a lot of people feel it is okay to drink a bottle of beer, it is okay and all of that. But I, I think these things do not present us well. But maybe I'm talking from the African context, maybe it's different over there. There are a lot of people in the denominations who would even see you because you are drinking, they get discouraged. They won't listen to anything you want to tell them. And so I find it heartbreaking when preachers stand on the pupils here in our congregations and they teach that, well, there's nothing wrong for you to drink just one bottle of beer. And you see some events, brethren go over, they buy beer and they drink and in public. That, that's really heartbreaking. Now, um, what I, I, I really appreciate Brother Donald Valea. He, he did a very wonderful job. And that's exactly the point I was making. Those passages he cited were spot on. Those passages prove to us that there can be wine that even the babies can drink that would not be intoxicating. They are all called wine. They are wine that are intoxicating. So I'm saying basically that whenever the Bible condemns people from taking alcohol, it actually refers to the intoxicating wine. And coming to the New Testament, there are other principles we can draw. I know there is no place that says thou should not drink wine. I, I know that for sure. It doesn't say if you drink wine you have sinned. But there are things we can, we don't have to prove things only by command. We can prove things by principles. And one of those principles is what I've just showed to us. Another one is the fact that the elders are told not to be given to wine. But we say it means, no, it means addiction, excess and all of that. But we cannot apply that to other things. So I don't want to speak much, basically, but I think we should just be careful with, you know, when we are teaching people that they can drink, people would go and, you know, how do we even know that the person is drunk? I find it difficult. A person says, if there is no way a person can know its intoxicating level without first getting drunk, and I will repeat that, there is no way a person can know is intoxicating level be f- without first getting drunk. If my intoxicating level, for instance, is two bottles, I, I don't drink, so I don't know, I'm just giving an example. If my intoxicating level is two bottles, then I must have drink, uh, taken more than two for me to know that, oh, this is where I need to stop. So we are basically saying that before a person will know his level, he has to first of all get drunk. That's what we're saying basically, because I can't know my level without first of all getting drunk. Thank you. Anybody got anything else? Let me let me say this. Go, brother Harvey. I'm gonna let you go next. Let me just say this about 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 you know when we talk about you know why. Now, one of the things we don't do uh, when we take the Lord's Supper. Notice in Matthew 26:29. Now, this is called fruit of the vine. See, to be called wine, brothers and sisters, it means ferment. This is why we don't drink wine. 
for the Lord's table because that's not because it's fermented. That is the miracle. The miracle is it takes time for uh, wine to, to ferment to be called wine. That's the miracle. Jesus turned water immediately into something that normally would take a lot of time to be fermented. He made it wine because it is fermented. We don't take wine at the Lord's table. We take what's called the fruit of the vine. We take grape juice. But if you let that Welch's grape juice sit a while, do you know that that stuff will ferment? And if you drink too much of it, you can get drunk if it ferments right. You can drink too much of it if it gets fermented, and you can become intoxicated. So sitting here talking about, oh, it's something you give the babies. You know, this scripture y'all reading from the Old Testament, it's ridiculous. It, doesn't, it doesn't prove what we're talking about. You can drink too much Formula 44D, which got alcohol in it, and get drunk. And we give that to babies. So to sit here and say, well, they gave it to babies, and he's talking about what babies can drink, alcohol, in the medicines we give babies. And if they drink too much, if I drink too much, there is a point to where I can get drunk. There are people get drunk at home on prescription medicines all day long. All hey, day see. long. Brother Steve. And, and, and so what I want us to see is to, to use this argument, wine is a ferment. That's what it is. Boy knows. We can't get over around that, brothers and sisters. For that's that's reason. Yes. But there is a scripture in the Old Testament where Jesus, uh, the Rechabite boys, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was it Jeremiah chapter 5? Right. They're told to drink wine. He, right, yeah, he says that's... a priest, he says a prophet. Yeah, Jeremiah 35. God sent Jeremiah that's... to the Rechabites and encourages them to sin, I guess. He encouraged them to sin. To drink wine, but but the, again, the argument is not on think wine. They're agreeing with wine, but the, the the scary part for for people with this doctrine is they can't believe that Jesus would be able to serve something that can cause people to sin. That's the issue. Can did Jesus actually make something that if people drank too much they would sin? My Jesus would not do that. That's the argument. That is the only argument we're dealing with right now. Jesus would not make something that could have caused people to sin. That's the only argument we're dealing with. Matthew 26 and 29, this is why we don't drink, don't drink wine for the Lord's Supper. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this. Now those what we drink, fruit of the vine. That's out of the wine press too. Fruit of the vine until the day when you drink it new with, and I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so we don't drink fermented drink. We don't, uh, under the old covenant, leaven was out of the house. Yeast. Yeast is symbolic of sin. And so they got the bread out of the house. I mean, they ate the bread, the, the, the yeast out of the house. And they also got all the things that could ferment out of the house. And they ate it quickly under the Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. But we do not drink fermented juice when we take of the Lord's Supper. Because if it ferments, it is considered wine, just like vinegar. Uh, brother, uh, who had their hand up? Uh, brother, was it Brother Green? Go ahead, Brother Green. Brother Javier, I'm sorry, Brother Javier. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Brother Henry. I uh, just want to say concerning, um, you know, Jesus had mentioned, uh, it's not what goes into the man that de defiles a man, but what can, comes out of him. And so when we look at the scriptures in Timothy 3, verse 8, it says, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre. And so it says the word given, not given to much wine. Now the difference between that and let's say the fruit that was on a tree that Adam and Eve ate, they're not to even eat that at all. That was off limits, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when it comes to the uh, wine, it says not give it too much wine. Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.23 says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for you, thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. And so he says here again, not a little wine. He says a little bit. You know, he didn't say much because we know much is what causes uh, drunkenness. Again, in Titus, you know, when we read Titus uh, chapter number 2, verse 3, the age women likewise, that they be in behavior, is becoming holiness, not false accusers, and not given uh, too much wine, teachers of teachers of good things. And so when it comes to what God has made and Christ has made, the fruit that 
turn into wine. He put it throughout all the earth. There's wine presses and wine vineyards all over the world. And God and Christ put it. But us as, as mankind, what we have to do is use wisdom and discernment uh, concerning our ways and obeying his commandments to not be given too much of it. Because he did create it, it came from his power, it came from his hand. But at the same time, just like in the wedding feast, God's commandment still is, don't be given too much wine. Now, Jesus' mother, she came and talked to Jesus. She said, she she talked to him concerning, um, you know, they need some wine. He said, what do you want, woman? Or I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But the idea is that he turned the water into wine. And, you know, that's the same number, 3, 6, I believe, 3, 1, from Timothy and Titus. And the book of, uh, I believe, John was where we read. And so the idea is that the commandment is still there. The commandment is still there to have self-control, discipline, not giving too much of it. Uh, because, you know, God made it, like I said, I'll say this again on all the close. He made wine all over the world. There's grapes all over the world, you know. And the idea is that even there, even though there's grapes all over the world, they're supposed to still be self-control. Noah, when he got off the ark, when it flooded, he was he made a vineyard, but he was supposed to have self-control and not get, get drunk. You know, and then many men, even uh, Lot's Lot, he let his daughters get him drunk. So the idea is that there has to be wisdom, there has to be a, a certain level of self-control and knowledge. Solomon talked about that as well concerning him uh, drinking. He said in Ecclesiastes, um, paraphrasing, uh, concerning um, still holding on to wisdom, you know, where he can grasp on folly. He was looking for folly. And so I just wanted to mention those scriptures. You know, it's not what goes into the man, it's what comes out of his heart that defiles them. And too much alcohol, if it's too much, it's going to defile you because it's going to control your conscience. But a, a small amount, as the Bible says, not giving too much of it, uh, will not. So I thank you. Okay, thank you, Brother Javier. Uh, Brother Lloyd? Uh, yeah, um, I was just thinking that um, uh, would this be an appropriate question to to ask if, um, if Jesus produced alcoholic wine at that feast, then it would be morally right and okay for us to drink it. Uh, then would it be morally right for us to produce it, to sell it, to distribute it, and make a living from it? Now, I think most of us would say no because we know certainly that if we did that, it would cause somebody to stumble. And we know it's not morally right to cause anybody to stumble. So I'm just putting that out there. Let me ask you something, Brother Lloyd. Yes, sir. Did they use wine as part of their offerings under the Old Testament? Uh, did they, was wine part of what they had to use? for their offerings under the old law? Offhand, I would say the word wine was, that we can read that. Yeah. If we bring that, but I don't believe that it was something. All right, so let's go now, see, and this is what I want us to get out of, but see, to, to but, say but, that but, it's but, wrong but, to have a winery or but, to but, produce but, wine, but, there's no but, scripture that says that. No, so no, 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 scripture, no, Leviticus 23, 13, I'm gonna read my, I'm gonna read my okay. answer. I want to read where they did they use wine as part of their sacrifice on the Old Testament. Leviticus 23, 13. Leviticus 23 and verse 13. Hold on, let me get there. See, to say that, oh, you can't have a vineyard, uh, produce wine, it's encouraging getting drunk. There's no scripture that says that, brothers. And, and the, Leviticus 23, 13. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour. Mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. Now let's look at that word wine. Let's see if it's intoxicated. Now this is under the law of Moses. Now this is what God the, the, used a prophet Moses to write. 
Now, we're going to pull up this word wine. Thereof shall be a wine, the fourth part of a hen. H3196. Yayin. Effervescent wine. As fermented. By implication, intoxication. Banqueting, wine, wine dipper. So, so, so say that it's sin for somebody to have to have produce wine for them to even have for the offering is on the Old Testament is there's no scripture that supports that. Brother, brother, go ahead, go ahead, brother. I'm, I'm saying that we would never put a stumbling block in front of anybody, would we? We're not, I mean, no, we wouldn't. And that's why I read Romans 14, 21. We shouldn't do that. Okay. We, 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 we should put a, but who says drinking wine? If, what I'm saying is, you have a liberty. We have a liberty, brothers and sisters, to eat and to drink whatever we want. You have a liberty. Drinking wine, there's no scripture that says that that's a sin. That's, what I, that's all I'm saying. But if it bothers you, then you stay away from it. If you have, if, it, if it hurts your faith, Romans 14, 12, this is what Paul is saying. I'm going to read mine. In Romans 14, 12, if that offends you, guess what? I am not going to drink wine in front of Brother Lloyd or Brother Leslie or anybody else on this Zoom call that, that has a problem with it because I don't want to wound your conscience. But I'm not going to let you put me or anybody else in a, in a religious straitjacket because they do. Romans 14, 12, I'm going to read this again. Romans 14, Romans 14. Romans 14 and verse number almost uh, verse number 23. Matter of fact, let's start with verse 21. Verse 20. For meat destroyed not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for that man who eat it with offense. So if it bothers you eating a pork chop, if you think oh this no call, if somebody on here thinks it's wrong to eat pork. Then amen. Then it is wrong for you to eat pork. And guess what? I will not eat it in front of you. That's but for right. you to tell me that I can't eat it, I'm not letting you put me in that jacket. Now look at verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine. Now you have to ask yourself, and we're going to be real about Christianity. Why would Paul even have to put drink wine in this verse if drinking wine was a sin? You have to Neither eat flesh nor to drink wine. Right. Nor right. anything whereby my brother stumbling or is offended or is made weak. Have you faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubted is damned if he eat. Now, if you eat the pork or you drink wine and you think it's wrong, you are damned. You're condemning your conscience. You are wrong. Because he eat it not of faith. Right. Whatsoever right. is not of faith is sin. Now, sin. just uh, continue on where, where, where I was talking about the, the stumbling part. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2.15, the Bible says, Woe unto him who that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also. Amen. So was Jesus so, making them drunk? What I'm saying it is that you, you, if you put, you can cause that person to stumble. How? By putting your, putting that bottle in his hand. Did I make them do it, or did they do it on their own? Did the devil make them do it, or did they do it on their own? But it says, "Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink." That means the person giving the drink. Brother, brother, I want you to go back, and I see your hand, Galaxy. I want y'all. I want you to go back. You, you're not. You're not doing anything different than what Adam did, blaming okay. God, blaming God for the woman no, you gave. No, no, that's, no, that's no, really no, what it is. No, God, no. the woman you gave me. If you would have gave me Eve, then I wouldn't have seen. <laughs> no, no, I understand what you're saying there, but look, it says, "Woe uh, Habakkuk two fifteen says, "Woe unto him uh -huh, that what that giveth his neighbor drink and what." That put it the bottle to that him and make it him drunk and make it him what? Make it him drunk in so the So was water. Jesus making everybody at that wedding drink? Did he did he just turn water and wine and say everybody got a drink? If it was alcoholic wine, yes. Okay. So if it wasn't alcohol, so if it wasn't alcohol, but you're saying it wasn't alcohol. Yes. So if it, based on your argument, it wasn't alcohol. Was he 
making everybody drink? I'm going to just use your, your analogy. It wasn't fermented. Was he making everybody drink? Even if it wasn't alcoholic, was he making everybody there to drink? I'm going to use your position. No. It wasn't alcoholic. Was he making everybody no. drink? No. Okay. So the, the issue isn't he was making people drink. The issue you have is if it was fermented. That's what you have. That's the issue. It, the alcohol is your issue. Brother Gallus. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I got a, I got a question, for brother Les. Uh, and the first, well, I have a couple of questions actually. The first question would be, how much wickedness would be considered a sin, uh, or that a person can do to be considered sin? Okay, you want me to answer that? Yeah. Any form of wickedness, it doesn't have a limit. No matter how little the wickedness is, it is sin. That's my answer. Okay. The reason I asked that question was because you alluded to, um, you made the statement rather, uh, uh, what was that, that to give into much wickedness. You know, we, right. we all understand that wickedness, any form of wickedness or any amount of wickedness, you know what I'm saying, is sin. Now, when the scripture says given to much wine, that means that you can't drink much wine. So that would, which leads to my next question is wine itself, is it a sin? Well, the Bible says in, 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 wine is a mocker. In that context, it is sin. Okay. Now, yeah. when it says it's a mocker, I, yeah. I, take, I, I take it as being too much wine would be a mocker. You know what I'm saying? And, but the thing is, for a person to drink wine or take a sip of wine, we can't say that's sin. You know? And uh, another thing would be, how can we prove that the wine that Jesus gave wasn't perfect? Wasn't what? Say that again, sorry. How can we prove through the scriptures that the wine that Jesus gave wasn't perfect? Well, the same way we cannot prove that it was fermented. That's just it. But, we are, we, we, okay, we, but back then, but when they when they got drunk, when they got drunk, what they get drunk out? Did the Bible says they, they got drunk? Oh, uh, that what? You said you you said they got drunk. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. What 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 did an individual get drunk out of back then? If it wasn't wine. If it wasn't wine, would they have gotten drunk? Is that your question? Now, I'm asking, if a, for a person, in order for an individual, say for instance, if, if you and I was under the old law, or uh, in Bible days, rather, and for us to get drunk, what would, we have, what would we have to drink in order to get drunk? Well, it, you have to drink excess wine to, for you to get drunk. That's, okay. That's, Okay, so excess wine. You see, but drinking wine wasn't simple. It's the excess of it that causes the individual to get drunk. That's why Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians 5, or uh, somebody correct me on that, Colossians 3, where it says, Be not, uh, uh, don't, uh, I'm messing it up, but I'm going to paraphrase. Don't drink too much wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Because we don't drink it. Okay, drinking too much wine could cause the individual to be drunk. You know what I'm saying? But we, we can overindulge in the spirit. You see, but the thing is, we can't say that an individual, it's a sin for an individual to drink. You know what I'm saying? Especially if they're not getting drunk. Now, what I do believe is that, say, for instance, I'm at a, I was at a get-together, uh, what was it, about four or five years ago. And there were some Christians there. Actually, it was a Christian gathering. Uh, well, it was, a, it was a Christian that held the gathering, I put it like that. And uh, a few of them was out there, they was drinking. And they asked me, they say, uh, Brother Mitchell, why, how come you don't drink? I say, uh, I know I have the liberty to get drink, uh, liberty to drink. I say, but suppose somebody is watching me that admired me, and they see a beer in my hand, and they don't know what the word says pertaining to that, or they're, not, they're definitely not seasoned in words to understand that that's, this could be my liberty. And I go, and they see a beer in my hand, I could cause that individual to stumble. You know what I'm saying? But I choose not to drink. 
You know, so, but the thing is, is that, you know, with some of our liberties, yeah, I do believe we can cause some individuals to stumble, but for me to say that it's wrong for individual individual to drink, I can't say that because I can't read that. You know, and, uh, and as far as the statement based on uh, the winery, you know, gluttony is a sin. You know, so well, are we going to shut down all the grocery stores because they sell food? You know, but to each his own when it comes to that, you know, and I, I can't necessarily say that it's wrong for an individual on a winery as well. So, but that's my comment. Yeah, you know, Thank you. Bro. Thank you, Brother uh, Mitchell. Uh, brother uh, Green? Yeah, I, I just want to say this. You know, first of all, we have to remember that the scriptures say that we are responsible for our own salvation. That's first and foremost. I want to say that. And the thing is, is that, you know, if a person thinks, and I'm paraphrasing the scripture, when if a person thinks that drinking wine is wrong, then to them, yes, it's wrong. You know, it, it is wrong. And the thing is, for us to say that, you know, and, and, and I want to understand, want you all to understand this too. Myself or none of us are advocating people to drink. We're not telling people to go out and drink. That's, that's not what we're doing, you know, but what we are saying that, like, say, for instance, if I take my wife out to dinner and I choose to have a glass of wine with my meal, now, I'm not drunk, I'm not intoxicated or any such thing, but just because I drank that glass of wine, I'm in sin because the last time I checked the scripture and I'm going to New Testament, like Brother uh, Leslie made the statement, about uh new testament when you go to first corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 and, and, and 10 it says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards and that's the word that Paul uses, drunkards. He didn't say a, a person that has a drink that's not intoxicated, because in order to be a drunkard, you have to be addicted or drink in excess to be drunk. So, you know, the thing is for us to say that it's wrong for a person to, to have a drink and, and, and they're not intoxicated, but yet they're still in sin, but the Bible says, nor drunkards, a person that is drunk. Who, who do you ever say, who do I ever tell it's okay to get a divorce and keep getting married, divorce? But see, that's what people start thinking. You're teaching, get married, divorce, get married, divorce, get married, divorce. Nobody said that. Just because God will give you grace because you got divorced for a reason under the fornication and got remarried. Nobody's saying, oh, it's okay to get divorced. God loves divorce. Nobody said that. But that's what the legal is. This is why they can't get this. This is why they they hate that doctrine of you can get married again even if you are separated for a reason other than fornication. They hate that. And they hate us teaching this because they think we're teaching married divorce, married divorce, married divorce. And we're not teaching that. We're just not putting laws where God didn't put laws. That's all we're doing. So there is no scripture that Brother Leslie can show, I can show, that nobody on here has shown. That it's a sin to drink wine. And no, I'm gonna say this, and there's no scripture that any of us shown that wine doesn't mean fervent. No, no, nobody's one word, boy knows. You know, okay, Brother Daryl. Brother Daryl. Hey Amen, Brother Stevenson. I, I just echo what you said, bro. Uh, that's what I was gonna go back to. Um, when you talked about the word oinos, and we talked about that word in John chapter two. Like I said, I, I, I don't want nobody to feel like I've been that I've been swayed because I studied this before with the brothers. Like I said, I was in the denominational world and they taught that too, the word affirmative. And until I started, I, I got baptized and I got the spirit on and started reading and reading. I was like, oh, okay, that's that's what it means. It means alcoholic. And so the, the question was at the very beginning, if, if a Christian have a glass of wine, is it a sin? It's not about, you know, you putting your, you know, uh, your worldly expectations on what you try to do to keep people sober, sober or not. It's not about that. Is it a sin? Yes or no? Because if, if, 
If I'm wrong, forgive me. If we go back to John chapter 2 and we look at that, and we look at the context, that same word in Brother Scoop to keep that going, it's there. The implication that you could be intoxicated if you yes. keep drinking it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, God bless So it, that, that, that scripture proves to us that it wasn't unfermented. That's what Amen. I'm saying. God bless you, God bless Brother you. Gibbons. Yes. You're, you're exactly right, my brother. God bless you, brother. Uh, thank you, Brother Gibbons. God bless you. Brother Green, and then we'll take this and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up. Brother Green? Corrected me just a moment ago on, on the statement that I made. That's all I want to say. Thank you, brother, for correcting Okay, God bless you, my brother. God bless you. I love you, brothers, sisters. We love everybody with the love of God. Okay, then, if there is any other any any other questions. Okay, let's remember Monday, we're going to have our brother uh, Donald, who will be teaching from Amos chapter 3, and encourage all the signing in. And brothers, let's under, and sisters, understand that. Let's all just go back and study. There is no... Uh, no big eyes and little you's on these Zoom study. We're all here to sharpen each other, learn and be humble. And I've been wrong before. I'm not ashamed to say that. If I can, I can be wrong again, and I want you to know that. But let's study and let's always have a heart, you know, to just want to read and believe, brothers and sisters. Read and believe and not infiltrate our mind, and, and that me included, with men's doctrines and maybe how I was taught and I believe in my traditions, okay? Are there any other prayer requests before we close out? Any, any prayer requests before we close out? Any prayer requests? Okay, Brother Sanders, can I impose on you to give us our closing prayer tonight, my good brother? Uh, yes. Uh, let us pray. Father God in heaven, Father, we're so thankful once again for this time that we have. Father, to uh, tune in via this Zoom study, Father, to study another portion of your word, Father, it's always our desire, Father, to study one with another, write the Bible, word of truth. Father, and come away being same mind, same judgment. Father, we know time, from time to time, that's not so much the case, but Father, it's our prayer that we lift up to you, Father, that us as your children, as Christians, uh, as your people in the kingdom, Father, that we're always on one accord, according to the scriptures. Father, again, we just want to thank Brother Gibbons for the topic, uh, to help him better understand it when he goes to Brother Stark and inquire him of his message that he taught about why father that again he's able to expound it in such a way father that when they leave and, and depart from one another they on one accord as well father we're so thankful for each and every one representing her on this zoom call for their love and labor father for the brotherhood uh, where they labor at their respective congregations father we just pray that you just continue to bless each and every one of us Father, and our families and those of us that are uh, leaders in the congregations, Father, that, again, when we stand before uh, your people, Father, that we are able to rightly divide the word and teach us that the Lord do not add nor take away. Father, just want to thank you for the many blessings that you bestowed upon each and every one of us. Again, Father, we lift prayer requests up on behalf of Brother Valera's family, Brother Scott's family, and Brother Gibbons' family. Again, Father, for we know you know all things. Again, Father, as always, we're mindful of, of the greatest gift, Father, that you have given us, which is your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, lived fully as a man and fully God, and he went to the cross. He was obedient all the way unto death, Father. And we're so thankful for his sacrifice, his blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, Father. And we just pray, Father, that we follow his example, follow in his footsteps, Father, and be about our Father's business just as he was. Again, Father, thank you so much. For all that you have done for us from the point of our birth to this present day. And Father, as we depart from this Zoom study, Father, we lay down, sleep, and slumber tonight. Father, we just pray if it be your will, you raise us up on tomorrow. Father, we go to our respected congregations. Father, and worship you in spirit and truth as you have commanded us. Again, Father, just want to say thank you for being God, our Father. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, our comforting God. And Father, we just pray that we not grieve nor quench him, Father, that again we get out of our own way. Allow him to guide us uh, unto all truth, Father. We just want to say thank you. So we lift these prayers, petitions, and supplications up, Father, on behalf of others as well as ourselves in the brotherhood. In Christ Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, my brother. Love y'all. See you. Good night. Okay. Good night.